were to start the recordings earlier next time. Um, but uh, that was all just introductory stuff anyway. Uh, where am I? Share screen. All right, I'm in a different place uh, today with the different uh, setup. So hopefully uh, um, everything will work. If not, yell at me and I will get things working there. So, um, all right, so you should see uh, use cases. This is kind of about where we uh, left off uh, last time. And um, so, um, yeah, these are just a few of them, but uh, uh, use cases for kind of an unmanned or maybe minimally manned uh, autonomous vehicle. Uh, it's not going to dive into use cases a whole lot because, boy, we could spend forever with different domains and um, needs and, and that type of thing, environments. Uh, lots and lots of different use cases, but it's helpful to kind of uh, focus our learnings in certain areas. And so uh, these are uh, some of the common ones for uh, conventional unmanned autonomous uh, land vehicles operating on uh, roads. Right. So um, what do we need to worry about? Well, uh, obviously, we want to keep any occupants or freight or payloads or whatever safe. Uh, particularly if there's people aboard, we need to be you know, provide them some level of comfort. Okay, so uh, for example, uh, we could uh, zip around corners, we could brake aggressively, we could accelerate aggressively, but that's not necessarily very comfortable, right? So um, we uh, probably need to not just make sure we stay on the road and don't hit things, but that our uh, passengers are comfortable while we're we're doing it. Uh, we probably want to um, have efficient use of our energy, and uh, also, um, you know, we uh, some Americans especially we're always in a hurry, right? So um, we probably want to, uh, within the other considerations and constraints, we probably want to get to a destination as quickly as we can. So, but what are some of the challenges here? So, um, well, a big one is ambient conditions, right? So, uh, particularly if we're uh, relying heavily on cameras, then uh, lighting is going to be a big issue. Uh, weather effects, uh, rain, sleet, snow, uh, these type of things uh, affect our uh, not only our ability to perceive things, right? If our uh, um, uh, cameras get occluded, but uh, it also affects our ability to control the vehicle, right? So if we have a nice covered road, then obviously we need to uh, handle things much, much more carefully than if it's it's dry. Um, and so. Um, you know, lighting is, as uh, go back to that one real briefly, um, you know, that can, uh, again, especially if we're using uh, regular cameras, then uh, we have issues at night, but we also have issues at uh, uh, sunrise and sunset when uh, we're uh, heading into the sun and or the the camera whatever camera we're working with is oriented uh towards the sun that can blind it uh saturates it and uh does not have enough dynamic range to to work anymore right so we we put on sunglasses we drop the visor we kind of stick our hand up there to kind of block the sun but um we we don't have uh, infinite flexibility to do that with uh, cameras. So that um, ends up being a consideration. Uh, occlusions are also uh, an issue. I mean, you know, I think we've um, you've driven a lot. Uh, you may have had the situation where, uh, you know, you, you are trying to see this uh, 
road sign, let's say you're in a left-hand lane of a interstate highway and there's a truck uh, right to your right, a uh, semi-truck, and you're trying to read the sign uh, talking about the next exit or speed limit sign or something like that, uh, but the truck's in the way, right? So we still have that same type of problem. Uh, signs can be blocked uh, by trees or uh, other type of uh, situations. Pedestrians, as I think we touched on last week, a uh, pedestrian might be, or a bicyclist, might be uh, occluded or, or blocked uh, visually by some other vehicle uh, or object, and um, uh, we may not uh, be able to observe them as easily as uh, we'd like. So, uh, and when we do see them, they may be partially occluded, so they may not like look like a person or look like a bicycle uh, because much of them are uh, occluded. So we recognize these as human beings, and so uh, we can potentially train our models to make sure we recognize um, these things, but, uh, but only if our training set includes uh, that type of uh, uh, data. And in fact, that's uh, if you've worked with uh, uh, machine learning a bit, then you've uh, probably looked at feature engineering. And one of the things that we might do in feature engineering is take a basic data set and then uh, manipulate it to try to create more uh, diverse data from the existing data. So you might take, um, you know, a, a nice clean image of a person, a pedestrian, and then uh, create another image where uh, you only see the top of them or the, the front of her or something like that, right? So, um, all right, so that kind of touches on edge cases, you know, those unusual cases, right? Uh, we need to uh, not just account for nominal driving conditions, but we need to uh, really focus on kind of those unusual events, right? Um, that might be in uh, things happening around us, but it might also be with our own vehicle where um, uh, we have a, a, a failure on our vehicle, a tire that blows out or uh, uh, something like that, right? And, um, uh, but also construction zones, uh, other cars doing things that are highly unexpected, uh, let's say a car crash right in front of you or, or something like that, right? So um, edge cases are what um, is, is really going to separate uh, the winners from the losers in terms of being able to handle these things, right? So, um, and hybrid traffic ecosystems, uh, of course, that's uh, we touched on that also. It's uh, it'll be uh, far easier to design autonomous vehicles when, if and when, all the vehicles out there are all autonomous, right? And uh, then we can, um, you know, make some better assumptions on how they're going to behave. But when we have uh, uh, a lot of different types of uh, systems out there, some that are uh, uh you know maybe fully self autonomous uh others that are just not autonomous at all still with the driver in them others uh that um might be collaborating with some other vehicles but not all other vehicles and that type of thing right uh competition speed's uh, a big issue um it's and it's um becomes more challenging as we have more sensors, more cameras, more actuators to control, um, and we're trying to move faster, right? So kind of the original um, uh, kind of workings with these things, if you kind of recall back to our first lecture where I touched on some of the history, uh, the DARPA challenges where, uh, uh, you know, teams are trying to drive autonomously across the desert. Well, they uh they didn't necessarily move very fast right and uh i think i showed a video of a uh, um uh, something in the uh, 1960s uh, uh from stanford to stanford cart that would uh actually kind of uh, pause 
uh, assess the scene, make some decisions, and then move a little bit, and then repeat, right? So um, obviously we want things to move much faster than that in real life, and uh, computation speed is going to be uh, pressed when we're uh, doing that. So um, trust, uh, again, we touched on that in the first lecture. Um, uh, you know, ultimately, users need to be able to trust these systems. And, uh, you know, as as a way of example, my girlfriend uh, rarely ever puts our Tesla into its autopilot mode because she's fed up with it. It's actually gotten a lot better. It, it does continue to evolve with updates that they push out all the time and uh, and stuff. But uh, uh, Elon already lost her trust. So uh, he's going to have to figure out how to get that back. Uh, one of the ways we deal with trust in AI in general is trying to explain some of the uh, decision making processes. Um, that's sounds easy it's actually quite difficult uh particularly in uh uh you know highly non-linear systems like uh, neural nets deep neural nets and uh they are learning from a database and um uh, or data set and we're not exerting a lot of control over exactly how they learn and so um you know, infamously, they uh, AI systems have learned to incorporate uh, racial or gender biases or uh, economic, uh, uh, you know, wealth-based uh, biases into various decision-making uh, type things uh, that you know maybe have found were correlative, maybe uh, because perhaps the data set used to train it was bias to begin with, right? Um, but it certainly, you know, uh, doesn't, uh, you know, it's a long way from any causality, right? So um, we want to be able to uh, explain how decisions are being made in autonomous vehicles. Um, in computer vision, sometimes what can be done is uh, to highlight the regions that the network is emphasizing when it makes a particular decision, right? So you might have, uh, you know, a thousand pixels in one, you know, x direction, a thousand pixels in the y direction, in some image, and um, you know, then let's say we're trying to detect a sign, right? Well, what features uh, are uh, is the system using to say that's a sign and that's where it is and that's what kind of sign it is, right? So we can kind of uh, highlight maybe some uh, rectangular uh, borders with a, a post uh, that it might be sitting on or, or attached to or, or something like that, right? So that uh, is, is showing what the network is uh, uh, kind of paying attention to, I'm using that term very loosely, um, but uh, paying attention to, right? So explainability is uh, is important, but also quite challenging. Uh, fault tolerance, uh, can how does the system deal with, um, uh, you know, uh, unexpected events, uh, a processor breaking a sensor no longer being available uh, that type of thing. So this is kind of a little bit more internally focused than the tire blowout, but it could also be a lack of ability to control the vehicle uh, or, you know, versus the lack of ability to sense what is going on with the vehicle or vehicles around us, right? Uh, but does, uh, can the system gracefully degrade uh, or does it need to uh, have uh, some level of redundancy to be able to keep going no matter what, <clears throat> or does it uh, enter a safe mode? And uh, what are the conditions and rules in which it does all of those things, right? So, um, but also put algorithmic stopping conditions in here. This is kind of a, uh, kind of a classic challenge for um, kind of optimization problems and 
so this might apply to generating a route. Um, there might be lots of different options to consider. How many of those do we consider? How hard do we work at optimizing that? That type of thing. And um, then economic, right? So uh, uh, the book talks about this a little bit. And um, uh, but yeah, uh, LIDARs are very expensive, getting uh, a whole lot cheaper than they used to be. But um, uh, they are they are still quite expensive. And um, you know, cars are ridiculously expensive these days and just getting more expensive, right? And uh, consumers uh, reach a pain point at which they won't buy a new car or the, they won't upgrade to that uh, more luxury item. Uh, you know, that, that's a function of present and uh, near future economic conditions or at least how the consumer perceives them. Uh, things like, uh, you know, loan rates and whatnot. Um, but uh, economic conditions are, uh, I think, always an issue in engineering systems, but particularly in this area. Uh, one thing that's interesting is, uh, for example, in the electric vehicle uh, market, uh, somewhat uh, related, uh, definitely, uh, definitely distinct from autonomous vehicles, but uh, there's a lot of synergy between the two. Um, you know, my perception of that market is that in the United States, we uh, started at the top end of the market. Uh, you know, for example, Tesla, um, once they played around with the Roadster, they introduced the Model X, right? And that was uh, well over a hundred grand uh, 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 price point for that car. Um, whereas in China, uh, uh, to what my friends have told me that have uh, lived there or traveled there, uh, that market kind of started at the low end of the market and introduced um, a lot of EVs at uh, very low uh, price points. Not as easy to do in autonomous vehicles, but um, still uh, interesting points of comparison there. All right, so we have some enabling technology. Um, you know, there's there's lots of different technologies that goes into this, uh, but certainly, um, you know, the mechatronics uh, uh, kind of revolution evolution uh, over the past few decades has really enabled a lot of uh, what we're able to do with autonomy. Uh, yeah, it, it used to be you had a manual stick shift and uh, brakes that were. Uh, connected uh, between the pedal to a, uh, a hydraulic system to your brake pads, right? And um, then uh, uh, steering was was mechanically connected also. Um, that has all uh, gradually become a drive-by-wire uh, type of technology where we have um, sensors and actuators and computer overrides and uh, manual overrides of the computer overrides and and that type of thing right so we uh, uh, we started we have automatic transmissions they used to be all gear and hydraulic operated and now they're uh, much more electrically operated same way with power steering um, and uh, um, uh, uh, breaks uh, to an extent also. Uh, so uh, lots of different things have uh, now uh, have a much tighter uh, uh, feedback system that's easily adapted to computer control, let's say. So mechatronics is a very kind of broad and vague type term, but uh, it is generally the idea that now we're able to control uh, mechanical systems using uh, electrical, uh, typically small, but that's not necessarily uh, the case, but uh, electrical actuators uh, with feedback from sensors and controlled by a computer of some sort. So uh, localization is a big issue also, uh, the ability to determine where are we. Right? And then uh, computer vision processing at speed, right? Uh, at how fast we're uh, trying to go. Uh, and that's been particularly uh, enabled, uh, uh, especially in the uh, machine learning 
uh, realm using graphics processor units uh, just because of the number of uh, cores and how easily the problem is parallelized and so we can uh, uh, speed up uh, training and, and inference by distributing the problem over many many hundreds of cores all right, so a little bit more about mechatronics. Uh, you know, drive by wire, we're looking at transmission, steering, brakes, or accelerators. Uh, we don't call them gas pedals anymore because uh, they might just be controlling the electric motor, right? So, um, previous generations mechanically kind of coupled driver inputs to actuators. And then we kind of evolved to hydraulic systems amplified by uh, that are amplifying human power. Um, Many components evolved to electrically controlled over the past few decades, and normally must provide some haptic feedback to the users, right? So um, that means that you get some um, feedback, let's say on your, your brake pedal, uh, as you press it uh, harder and harder, you should kind of get some uh, force feedback to that um, so that you can, gradually apply the brakes or you can stomp on them and and you can feel the, the difference uh just sliding a potentiometer or or uh, uh, uh an encoder of some sort across uh, wouldn't necessarily give you that type of feedback same type of thing for your accelerator uh, accelerator pedal um you wouldn't uh want it to uh basically be just like a knob um you, you want some uh, springness to it or, or feedback, haptic feedback, uh, so you can control it. And obviously this doesn't strictly apply to completely unmanned vehicles because we don't have any of those controls. Uh, so instead of haptic feedback, going back to you know our, our pressure sensitive skin uh, type of things, our appendages, uh, we're providing sensor feedback to uh, a closed loop feedback uh, system. So, um, you know, ultimately these mechatronics uh, facilitate computer connection and control. So uh, this kind of blends into software defined machines. Uh, so one of my areas of expertise is software defined radio. Um, and that's was long, long, long kind of a, a bastion of analog, right? Uh, radio waves and um, uh, whatnot is, uh, seems to be very analog. But uh, these days we are pushing uh, digital conversion closer and closer to the analog world. And uh, that is enabling much more uh, done in software. There, there is a distinction, uh, right? So you can have, uh, you can digitize the analog world and then um, deal with things in digital hardware. Uh, perhaps that hardware is defined by a hardware description language like VHDL or Verilog, um, but it's still hardware. Um, the you know greater evolution, so to speak, of that is to implement all those digital logic functions in software, in software code. And um, so uh, more and more subsystems of all sorts are being uh, software defined. That makes it even more uh, inherently computer controlled. <laughs> it also allows us to update things a lot easier. We can put in uh, case statements and if statements and branching logic and uh, call different subroutines uh, and uh, uh, so adapt in real time, but we can also uh, update all that software in the field. Sure, you can do that with FPGAs also, uh, but it's, uh, it just becomes much uh, easier and productive as we become more uh, software defined. So um, these things, uh, the the electrical and hybrid drive, these aid in precision control. So uh, we're able to uh, have these uh, you know, actuators that are controlled by feedback loop that is continually monitoring these sensors and, um, and also. All right, so um, yeah, just a couple of um, 
examples here uh, as we look at different types of ways that we might apply autonomous vehicles um, and that technology. And here's some current solutions are our, our, uh, our robo taxis from Waymo and uh, Cruz. And they're uh, currently operating in actually lots of different areas, but I just put down kind of some of the areas that they're more um, uh, prevalent in or maybe uh, operating in at more uh, a, a, a more in, involved lay, level. Uh, San Francisco probably has gets the most press about this, right? So um, then you have the manned autonomous uh, driving, and uh, examples of those are your Tesla full self driving or autopilot, which is you know more of an assisted type of uh, autonomous driving system. Uh, Cadillac Escalade, a Super Cruise, Genesis G90. As highway driving assist, there's uh, lots more. You can look at uh, this link. I think it's fairly recent. I encourage you to go follow that and read that uh, read that article to kind of get an understanding of um, the uh, uh, current state of the market. Um, we also have food delivery, right? So uh, we're not just uh, driving people around in robo taxis, but we're uh delivering and and i use food it can be freight uh uh you know the uh the uh, amazon delivery drones and that type of thing the local science and technology university where i live uh it's uh 15 minutes down the road uh university of missouri science and technology at rolla uh they have food delivery drones that are running around campus and uh, so you can, you know, sit in your uh, dorm or um, or frat house or whatever, and order uh, order some food from the uh, food service or uh, similar top thing. And uh, it's uh, maybe the size of a um, kind of lawnmower sized, right? So it's a little taller and, and narrower than that. Uh, but it's about the same length as a push push lawnmower, not a riding lawnmower. It's smaller than that, and uh, it just kind of cruises along on a sidewalk. So it's not on the road, uh, so it's a quasi road vehicle. Um, but it will will cross intersections if it figures it out. I've seen it where it hasn't figured it out and it's stuck. Um, so I guess your food gets cold sometimes. Um, all right, uh, another project I worked on uh, is not an off-road type of thing. This is not a, a fully autonomous uh, thing, but it's the Army's robotic combat vehicle. Uh, this is mostly remote control, uh, but will be augmented with uh, autonomy for situations where communications are denied. Right, so your your enemy might jam your communications, or you may have uh, driven this thing a little too far away, and uh, the radio can't uh, connect to it anymore. And uh, so it it will have you know, these these things are still in development, but uh, it will have an ability to uh, uh, kind of backtrack to an area where it can regain communications um, or operate under some uh, level of autonomy while uh, it's unable to be remotely controlled through uh, communications. And these are, uh, by the way, limited, uh, are, are range from um, something that's a little bit more than like a side-by-side -side utility vehicle, uh, and that's the light version, and that's the one that they're developing first, uh, all the way up to uh, the heavy, which is uh, something more akin to a full-size tank. Um, and the medium is, is kind of split in between. Um, you know, here's the, some of the challenges you run into is you don't necessarily have high resolution maps. You might be operating in a, uh, an area that you haven't been before. Uh, it might be uh, enemy territory or it might be contested territory. So your ability to even develop uh, high resolution maps is very challenging. Uh, you may not be operating on the roads, right? You might be operating in fields or uh, forested terrain or, or whatnot, right? So you don't necessarily uh, have an ability to follow links. Um, you know, 
a road vehicle. It's um, mostly looking for the stripes on the road and staying in between those lanes, right? What happens when you don't have that? You're operating in a desert. That was one of the things that DARPA was really uh, uh, challenged uh, challenged the teams with in their early challenges. Um, and, you know, terrain, it can just be difficult to uh, uh, navigate or, or even move over, right? So um, uh, the Army also and, and some others also have this uh, convoy leader follower type system. Uh, I'll post a, a video of that uh, uh, or two on uh, on Moodle. Um, but uh, this is uh, a lot of... A lot of what's done in uh, military operations is logistics, moving uh, moving supplies around, whether those supplies are are fuel or water or food or or ammunition or spare parts, um, or you know uh, um, you know tents and uh, stuff for uh, soldiers to uh, have a forward uh, uh, base to uh, to live at. Uh, that type of thing, right? So lots of different things to move around, and the Army spends a lot of time and effort doing that. Uh, so the idea is that, well, let's just put one crew and a vehicle up front, and uh, they can do all the navigation and driving, and all the other uh, freight vehicles are designed to follow them. And uh, however they turn, uh, the followers will will follow them. So it's kind of a hybrid, unmanned, uh, uh, autonomous type system. All right, uh, aerial and uh, air and space uh, type of things. So um, yeah, we look at aerial drones. Uh, these um, need to make uh, decisions uh, faster. Okay, so here what I mean by aerial drones is something like a uh, uh, the um, oh no I forget the name of the Mars helicopter I think it starts with a P but um, right so um, if it's if it's a land uh, uh, drone running around on Mars or even the moon well you you have some uh, communication latency. Um, but you uh, can move very slowly, right? So, uh, uh, but the aerial drones, well, you're highly limited by your energy. And so if you're going to fly, you need to fly and get the job done, right? So uh, uh, before you run out of energy and have to wait to recharge and that type of thing. So uh, the uh, certain systems need to be able to make uh, decisions um, locally rather than going all the way back to Earth, uh, which can take uh, quite a long time uh, in some of these uh, situations. So um, uh, the Gateway is the name of NASA's uh, planned lunar orbiting station, and uh, they have uh, done a number of uh, uh, grant solicitations looking for autonomy systems on that uh, to because that um, is it's designed to orbit the uh, the moon, but it will not necessarily be continuously manned like the ISS is, right? So uh, they're trying to put a lot of autonomy into that system, and also just to uh, do a workload reduction. Now it's less less to do with the you know maneuvering of uh that it's an it's in a free fall orbit around the uh the moon uh orbiting around the moon is quite different than orbiting around the earth because the mass is so low but um the mass of the moon is so low but um but it, it there's a lot of autonomy uh issues involved in uh running that station um, you've probably heard about OSIRIS-REx, the asteroid sampling mission that went out and actually uh, grabbed some stuff and brought it back. Um, the Space Development Agency um, is developing uh, a lot of autonomy here. Uh, again, for this is from low Earth orbit. Um, 
less to do with maneuvering uh, and more to do with just autonomous type of things. But there's a lot of uh, overlap in the technologies uh, because in a um, lower Earth orbit satellite constellation, you uh, are highly constrained in size, weight, and power. Um, and uh, you sometimes need to make decisions very quickly, so you can't just uh, run uh, the, all the data back to uh, some ground station. Uh, communication links aren't that good. And uh, then, uh, you know, but let's say you could and then run it on some cloud uh, thing and then send back uh, the results. Well, uh, there, there are some missions that, uh, particularly with hypersonic missiles, that uh, can't tolerate that level of latency. So they're putting in um, uh, what's called these overhead persistent infrared sensors, OPERS, and they're uh, just uh, infrared looking down at the Earth. And uh, one of their main use cases is to detect hypersonic missile launches and, and tracks, uh, be able to track them. Um, and because uh, they're flying so fast, they put off a lot of heat even after their engines cut off. Um, and they're they're in a more advanced phase of their uh, trajectory, um, but they're they're uh, comparatively easy to see in infrared. Um, but yeah, we got to make sure uh, we're putting the right intelligence up there to track them um, and uh, be able to make decisions. Uh, naval type applications. So uh, this uh, there there's plenty of. Um, uh, maritime, uh, commercial maritime applications. There's some uh, work being done to do ocean-going, ocean-crossing autonomous ships, tankers, freighters, uh, that type of thing. Uh, if we look at defense-type applications for surface ships, um, uh, the U.S. Navy in particular is retiring a lot of their uh, cruisers that date back to the Cold War era and uh, even some of their destroyers, and those uh, used to uh, carry a lot of missiles. Uh, and so uh, retiring those ships without necessarily having replacements uh, means that we're uh, uh, going to be short a lot of uh, abilities to launch missiles and uh, has Congress and uh, the Navy quite concerned. So um, there's some uh, there's a lot of efforts on uh, doing autonomous vehicles, uh, vessels, surface vessels in a Navy, and uh, some of the farther out thoughts are to deploy them with missile tubes. So, uh, and then obviously resupply uh, is a big deal. Um, and uh, but there are the challenges: are uh, yeah, can these things handle long distance? Uh, can they? Um, uh, have an unattended propulsion system. Uh, so can that propulsion system, if it's really going to be a long distance type of thing, can it run without uh, a crew in the engine room maintaining that engine? Um, so um, might talk more about that at the end of the course. Uh, submarines, uh, also some of the applications there are uh, anti-mine. Uh, submarines have always, uh, past attack submarines have always played a surveillance role. Um, but uh, yeah, do we really need to put uh, men and women at, in harm's way to do that? Or can we uh, do a lot of that autonomously? Uh, navigation. Uh, so there's lots of challenges on, on all of these. I'm just kind of highlighting some. Um, these also have long distance and intended propulsion. Uh, navigation is just more challenging because you don't always uh, have access to GPS unless you, uh, uh, you know, go to a periscope depth and, and raise an antenna. Um, and so uh, you need to do uh, other means of, of navigating effectively. So, all right, uh, that was the end of that one. Let's see, we've been at it for 45 minutes. Let me get started with uh, localization, and uh, then maybe we can uh, 
figure out a good time to take a break. So, um, all right. So, yeah, uh, again, localization will be in two lectures uh, or more. And uh, today we'll uh, dive into uh, GNSS systems uh, and look at how they actually work um, and look at some of the uh, ways that we can actually improve their accuracies even more. And then uh, we'll follow that at some point with uh, Odemetry, which uh, maybe another word for that is dead reckoning, but uh, basically just kind of keeping track of uh, what direction you go and how fast and for how long. And if you know where you started from, then you can kind of uh, make a good guess at where you end up with uh, if you just kind of keep track of that. And um, um, uh, sailing type, um, you know, uh, boating, shipping type applications, you might call that dead reckoning. Um, so, um, all right, but let's look at the big picture first. Uh, many autonomous vehicles leverage detailed maps and road networks. It uh, doesn't do you a lot of good unless you know where you are on that map, right? So, um, determining the position of the ego vehicle is a necessary step to uh, to using a map. Uh, at a minimum, 2D localization is generally required. Um, you know, you need to know uh, your X and Y, or, or maybe we'll call that a latitude and longitude. Um, and, uh, but in some cases, uh, you might be concerned about 3D, uh, your altitude or your depth. And uh, then you're also probably concerned about your orientation or your heading, uh, what direction you're heading. Uh, and uh, you might need to, uh, uh, need to, to know that, right? Not just trust that you're going in a particular direction, but be able to measure that. Um, so how do we specify location? Well, there's a bunch of different ways. And, uh, but for GIS or geographic information systems, uh, which is kind of the generic general uh, way of talking about how we relate locations on you know, in, a, in an area like the Earth, right? So um, uh, latitude is going to be uh, the, the angle between the equator and uh, all the way up to the pole, right? But it's it would be phi in this uh, uh, diagram up here on the upper right. You know, so uh, an angle of zero is at the equator. Positive angles run up to plus 90 degrees. Uh, we usually do talk about degrees rather than radians or anything. Uh, at, but uh, 90 degrees at the pole and uh, minus uh, degrees down to uh, the south pole. Right? So, um, and uh, these, you'll notice, uh, are equally spaced. No matter where you are, uh, the distance, uh, let's say, between 10 degrees here is, uh, the, uh, is the same as we go up. Um, longitude is uh, specified in, in east or west from the prime meridian at Greenwich Inlet, or very close to it, we'll say. Uh, so, uh, and this tends to run minus 180 uh, and, uh, or plus 180, minus 180 could be specified as uh, 180 degrees east or 180 degrees west. Um, or, or anywhere in between it. Note that uh, these are your lines of longitude, and uh, I always was always taught uh, to uh, think of these as these are all very long lines, right? They stretch from pole to pole, and they're actually all the same length. Um, but uh, because they're long, those are your longitude lines, right? So, um, and the other ones are your latitudes, right? So uh, latitudes, notice that the circumference is different. It's very small at the pole, but very large at the equator. But the spacing between each of these is the same. Longitude, 
lines converge at the poles, but are the widest at the equator, right? But the spacing, these are not, okay, so down here, it kind of looks like a square rectangle, but as you get closer up here, you realize, oh, these are, these are more like trapezoids, right? So um, these lines are not parallel to each other. And, uh, and also, um, you have to be careful about that. All right. And then altitude, um, when, when it's important, uh, that might be from mean sea level, typically. But, uh, you know, there's, there's different ways of specifying that, uh, depending on what's important to the application. All right. So, uh, but let's get a little bit more real. Uh, the Earth is not a perfectly round sphere. It's uh, what we call an oblate spheroid. In other words, it's a little fat, uh, kind of like me. So um, it's, uh, instead of eating too many carbs, it's fat because it is uh, spinning around an axis. And that centripetal force um, uh, causes the equator to bulge and uh, the poles to kind of shrink towards each other. So it's it's basically a little bit squished. Uh, so we call that oblate spheroid, but that's really what's happening. Um, it's also not homogeneous, right? So uh, there's various uh, uh, differences in magnetic force and gravitational force and the mean sea level, uh, uh, that type of thing. And in fact, the uh, mean sea level changes quite a bit between the equator and the poles. Um, so uh, these can be important in very precise uh, situations. Uh, uh, for example, if you're uh, sending our uh, uh, weaponry of some sort, let's say an artillery shell, or let's say an ICBM, uh, a long ways, then you may want to know uh, how some of these things change over um, over uh, large large distances. So, um, so there's actually a lot of research done on this. Uh, the GPS system uses what's called WGS84, which is just a kind of international standard uh, for uh, kind of orienting these things and kind of dealing with some of these uh, inhomogeneities um, that actually places the zero degree longitude point about 100 meters east of the prime meridian. So uh, in reality, zero degrees is not at the prime meridian, but it's awfully, awfully close. If you want to look more at that, uh, there's a couple of links there. Um, uh, you can spend quite a bit of time diving into all the intricacies there. Of course, we uh, hopefully accept that the Earth is not flat, uh, but we like to work with flat maps. <laughs> it's uh, oftentimes convenient, and so um, uh, you know, then you have different ways of projecting the uh, spherical uh, features of the globe of the Earth onto a flat surface, uh, the Mercator. Uh, projection is perhaps a, a Western-centric uh, projection, um, but uh, but yeah, it's um, uh, kind of the most famous one. It uh, um, distorts the sizes of Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, basically, anything at the poles uh, near the poles is it's distorting um, uh, because those lines or the circumferences of latitude should be much smaller, uh, but they all get stretched out. You see here, now these lines of longitude are running parallel to each other instead of converging at the poles. So, um, and and therefore we're ending up creating these uh, blocks or orthogonals uh, there. All right. Um, we also want to know what direction we're facing. Uh, and we probably want to know that with respect to a reference frame. Um, now, uh, that um, might be the Earth. Uh, 
or it might be a, a much more local type of uh, reference frame to understand which direction we're uh, we're heading. Um, that can you know be specified in 3Ds uh, for um, airplanes, submarines, ships, and some vehicles. Uh, um, you might talk about these in terms of pitch, roll, or yaw, or or an Euler angle matrix. Uh, if you want to get fancy, uh, you can look at uh, quaternions. Quaternions. Um, these are kind of used both in in satellite orientations and also in uh, video games um, because uh, there's an issue called uh, gimbal lock that can show up in both of those uh, situations where uh, with this Euler angle matrix, you might be rotating in three different uh, directions, but if uh, one rotation causes, um, it, it can cause a loss in a degree of freedom uh, if your axes uh, line up instead of having orthogonal axes. So, um, you know, that's, that's just for fun if you want to dive down into that kind of uh, rabbit hole. Uh, localization over time is another aspect that we might be, and we, well, actually, we're certainly concerned about, right? So over time, we're not just interested in where we are at this moment, but we want to know where we're going to be and where other vehicles are going to be. Um, so we need to have some understanding of our, our track uh, or, or said another way, our speed and heading, uh, which, which direction we're going and how fast we're going. Um, we may or may not have the aid of an accurate map in uh, doing that. Um, so, and uh, again, a uh, frame of reference is important uh, to understand, well, what we're using. Uh, think about uh, your, your physics, if you studied a little bit of uh, relativity, uh, and uh, uh, what reference frames are you using? Are you using, uh, you know, in, in the case of, you know, Einstein and, and space, we might be uh, talking about the Earth as a reference frame, or the Sun as a reference frame, or our galaxy as a reference frame, and uh, that type of thing, right? So, um, are we using our present vehicle? as a reference frame? Are we using a road as a reference frame? Or are we using uh, the earth um, as, as a reference frame? And, you know, the center of the earth, the poles, uh, that type of thing. So, um, all right. Um, what are our objectives in all of this, right? So I keep hammering on this as we go through the course, but uh, accuracy. Uh, how much can we reduce our error sources so we can get more accurate uh, type of uh, measurements of our uh, lo location? Sometimes precision uh, is really what's limiting us uh, versus accuracy. Right? Uh, speed, how fast can we determine a fix? Okay, so uh, define fix is your, uh, is a, a term we use uh, that says we're, we're establishing our location, right? So uh, that can be a, a GPS fix. When our GPS receiver spits out an answer that says we're here, that is, has established a fix. It might be um, uh, determined from celestial navigation and a sextant and uh, reduction tables and a whole bunch of calculations. And then ultimately you you arrive at a fix and you put that on your chart and say, that's that's where I'm at, right? So uh, that's a generic term to mean establishing your location. Uh, so we want to be able to do that pretty quickly because that could be a limiting factor on how fast our, our vehicle could move. Um, can it be trusted? Uh, or, you know, is there a possibility that it could be manipulated or, or spoofed? Uh, U.S. military in particular, but I'm sure uh, lots of other entities are very, very concerned about this right now. Um, and uh, because spoofing does occur on uh, a frequent basis of GPS signals. GPS signals, as we'll see, are, are very weak 
And um, so uh, it's easy to kind of override them with a local transmitter and uh, you can synthesize them so you can spoof it. And there's been examples of where uh, in, a, in a harbor area or something, ships are uh, seeing their GPS report them to be uh, significantly elsewhere uh, than where they're at because of uh, spoofing uh, operations. So reliability, can you trust that? Availability, um, you know, does GPS work in a tunnel? Uh, no, um, you know, um, can visual based systems work at night or in a rainstorm? Um, uh, if it's cloudy, you're going to have a hard time doing even celestial navigation. Um, and, uh, and can it work in the presence of jamming? So, uh, those are, uh, our, um, important considerations uh to look at uh let's see can i give you one of these okay um Okay, I hope you can hear me because I'm I'm seeing that uh, I'm trying to share a poll with you and it's telling me that it's trying to connect. I wonder what's wrong there. Um, uh, I guess I got a login thing here. Uh, okay, uh, I'm going to uh, re-log in. Uh, but in the meantime, let's take a 10-minute uh, break today. So I've got uh, 7.36 Eastern time, so let's meet back at 7.46. Uh, and uh, But in the meantime, if you get a chance and I get uh, a poll posted, uh, take a, a look at that.